Hello everybody and welcome to Omnipo, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. I'm Jack and today I'm here with Joe for our second half of the Ancient Origins set review. Um, we've done the Pokemon, we're now going to look at the trainers, usually the more influential of the set, um, but hopefully this one won't be as long. We've got less cards to talk about, so let's hop right into it. Um, Joe, do you want to start off with Ace Trainer? Yeah, sure. Um, Ace Trainer is one of the first, well, it's the first supporter we'll chat about. Um, first of all, the thing to mention is it reads, you can play this card only if you have more prize cards left than your opponent. That's already like a big reason to not like this card. Uh, let's look at the overall card effect, though. Uh, so if you have more prizes left than your opponent, you can use this card, and it says each player shuffles his or her hand into his or her deck, and uh, then you draw six and your opponent draws three cards. So there's two things that spring to mind of old. Uh, the first one is N. N is a card that we've had over the last couple of years, and it's been fantastic. It's been a staple card because uh, for the most part of the game, early on, it's going to be great for draw power. And then in the late game, it's a disruption for your opponent. And I guess Ace Trainer tries to combine the two, really. Uh, getting you a stable six cards is nice. Giving your opponent only three to work with. Obviously, that's less powerful than N's potential, because you can give your opponent only one card and then a one-card top deck, giving them a maximum hand of two. Um, or I guess the minimum, if N is, at, is doing his best. And Ace Trainer nets your opponent four cards every time once they've top deck for turn so not quite as disruptive as n uh, it will always draw you more cards than n if you're able to use it though so that's quite nice to think about um so slightly stronger late game in terms of a draw card than n was um but not as strong in terms of disruption and the fact is you always have to have more prize cards left than your opponent um obviously a lot of the time people who were ahead didn't want to play their own ends and um i guess you can't with Ace Trainer, but at least they still had the option, so that's nothing to worry about. Uh, the other thing is Twins. Twins was a card that saw play despite having the same thing that Ace Trainer had, that you can only play it if you have more prize cards left. However, Twins got you two of any card. It was so powerful, and a lot of people just used it in decks like Vileplume, ironically enough. Uh, the Vileplume that got reprinted, um, pretty much reprint anyway. Uh, so that people could just go wreck Andy Vileplume to secure themselves a turn to Vileplume. Uh, Ace Trainer doesn't have that strong of an effect that Twins has. Uh, just getting you six shuffle draw cards is pretty standard, really. Uh, like We have Shauna that can do five every single turn. Uh, and the three cards, plus your opponent gets to draw one for their turn going back into theirs. Um, they have four. That's not really too disruptive, in my opinion, so... Um, I think simply the first bit of text that, re that it reads makes me not want to play this card. If it didn't have that text, it would be fantastic, but I would still rate N over it. Unfortunately, we can't play N anymore. So people might play just one Ace Trainer in their decks uh, because of VS Seeker means that we can try and get usage out of this card like maybe two to three times a, turn a game. Um, but overall, not over-impressed. It's not the new staple that everyone should be playing. Um, and it's not really a huge disruption card either, so it doesn't really fit the purpose of either of the two cards that we've discussed, unfortunately, in my own opinion. Yeah, it's sort of floating in between. Um, Ace Trainer's in no means an awful card, but it's never going to see more than a one or two copies of in each deck, simply because um, if you're going ahead in prizes, then it's two wasted cards in your deck, and uh, it, that's just not very useful. Um but like you say, you can VS Seeker support it back. Uh, yeah, v yeah, VS Seeker for to get your support for the turn, get it back um, if you are going behind. And a lot of the time, like you say, it is better than N for yourself later on in the game. Um, but it's also better better than N for your opponent. So again, it's a it's a card that floats in between twins, in between N, um, with a sort of mediocre effect overall that isn't game changing at all, really. Um, next up, we have. I believe it's Hex Maniac. Hex Maniac is the other um, supporter in the set that isn't a reprint, at least, um, and is really a lot better than Ace Trainer. It's definitely going to see... Um, it's not draw support. It's definitely going to see a one or two copies of in pretty much all decks, um, unless there's any real reason why you're not going to be wanting to Hex Maniac yourself. Basically, um, when you play it, until the end of your opponent's next turn, no, uh, you can't activate any abilities. So, um, things like Altaria, Vileplume, and Aegislash, all three of their abilities are negated until the end of your opponent's next turn. Uh, so, we said in the first video, 
Uh, I'll first pick up on Vileplume. Vileplume, obviously, locking out of items. If you Hex Maniac, um, you get out of the irritating pollen ability and can then start playing your own items. However, your opponent can then play their items as well. So it's sort of um, a bonus for both, but a lot of the times it's going to um, benefit you a lot more than your opponent. With Altaria, you can turn off clear humming um, to get like a crucial knockout on a Mega Rayquaza or things like that. Um, just for the one turn where you need to go two prizes ahead to be able to secure the game from there. And then the same again with Aegis Ash EX. If you've built up something with a lot of special energy, um, you can then sort of use the Hex Maniac and deal a huge chunk to Aegis Lash um, and sort of really put your opponent at behind you in terms of the game state because you've taken two prizes they perhaps weren't expecting you to take um, in throwing up an Aegis Lash and locking you. Um, same with things like the new Giratina which locks all damage from Megas. There's just lots of different uses for Hex Maniac. Um, another thing that you may see, people may just use Hex Maniac on turn 1 if it's the only supporter they've got just to avoid their opponent from using things like Shaman EX to begin their setup. Um, it, in general it's just a really really disruptive card and it's a really interesting way of um, stopping abilities. We've got a few ability stopping sort of mechanics at the moment and I think this is definitely the most versatile of them all. Yeah this is definitely a versatile card. I really like it. Like you say as a one or two of. It's not really like the new Garbodor. I don't feel like someone's going to be playing four of these for VS Seeker hoping to stop abilities every turn for everyone. Because uh, that's just really detrimental, you not having a supporter every turn, especially because you can't use, you know, Pokemon abilities to get you drawing, like Shaman and stuff. So I don't feel like it's that type of card, really. However, it's fantastic for things like Rayquaza. Um, just matchup wise, like, Metal at the moment is keeping uh, Rayquaza in check with stuff like Aegislash. Um, now you can just Hex Maniac your way through that as if it was nothing. Um, on the flip side, Altaria gets a lot weaker and now like Manetric could really benefit from it at the right time. Um, everyone would love to do it against a Vileplume because of course then you can reuse a VS Seeker to have Hex Maniac again for when you want to re-break the lock. Um, so it's good for just getting through hurdles that otherwise would harm someone or slow you down which is really cool. Um, but it's also like a real nerf to decks like Bronzong because if you can like identify when your opponent's needing a Bronzong the following turn um, to maybe get a KO, or if they're looking just even to attack, um, you can Hex Maniac them and like take a knockout in, in the same turn, and then force them to have no real response. And it can really slow down those types of decks. Definitely stuff like Aromatisse, Bronzong, they really have to be very careful about when they do use their abilities now. You can't really just say, oh, I've got the metal in the discard pile, I'll just use it later, because it, it'll be fine. Um, now you've got to really think about where you're getting these attachments just in case you do get Hex Maniac. So it brings a third time, uh, like another dimension to the game because most people are, are going to be playing one or two of this card. And with VS Secret, it means we can use that very frequently throughout um, the game when we really want to. So those decks have to be very like on high alert for this card uh, in general. And it does make these sorts of Mighty Shield type abilities a bit worse, I'd say. So on to the next couple of supporters now. Um, they are both reprints that we've already seen before, so Lysander on the left and a Full Art Steven, which is very nice looking and shiny, so pick those <laughs> up if you want to have a Full Art Steven playset or something. Um, yeah. Not too much I need to say about it really, but uh, what do you reckon Jack, any relevance um, to these new guys? The only real thing that we can talk about I think as far as these thing, uh, these cards are concerned is rotation wise. Um, obviously the Steven is completely irrelevant, it was in uh, either last set or two sets ago, we just needed the English version because um, the Japanese had already had their full art Steven. Um, I think the Lysander is really interesting though. Based on what we've seen, I think I'm I, I'm relatively confident in saying, um, and don't quote me on this, but I'm relatively confident in saying we're going to have a Phantom Forces rotation, uh, on, Phantom Forces on rotation next year, and then an Ancient Origins on rotation the year after. Um, just because we're getting draws, oh, well, we're getting shuffle support and a Lysander reprint. Um, so uh, and that's simply because we got the Professor Sycamore reprint in um, Phantom Forces, and then we've got a new Shuffle Draw and a Lysander reprint here. Um, the only real thing from that I think we can 
sort of think about is I feel relatively confident we're going to be getting some sort of new draw support in the next one or two sets, simply because if we do go into an, into an Ancient Origins um, uh, rotation onwards, we don't actually have any draw support other than what's in the set already. So we're either going to see another reprint of Sycamore, which I kind of don't want to see because I want some new draw support, um, or we're going to see, like I say, some new draw support in the f next couple of sets. In I, I That's just my opinion, but I think... Um, that could be where we're going with this, with this Lysander reprint, because it's completely based on rotation. Um, it works completely for the rotation. There's no real reason for them to reprint Lysander. Um, so it's just when Lysander rotates out in a couple of years' time, um, we still have a Lysander in format. Uh, nothing really else to talk about these, um, but I feel relatively confident in saying we're going to be getting some sort of new draw support um, supporter in the next set or two, uh, in my opinion. That's about it, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think we need draw support at the moment. Unless pe uh, Pokemon's going back to a time when it's Pokemon draw support, like everyone had played like a two-two Claydol back in early Diamond and Pearl sets. So uh, maybe we're just straying away from supporter draw and going into Pokemon draw. But you're dead right about the um, they're rebooting supporters. It's not just to fill a card in the set. They're doing it on purpose. They're thinking ahead, um, and I think that's uh, spot on there. Good predictions, I'd say. Uh, you've not really stuck your neck out too much there. It's all good thinking, I'd say. Okay. <laughs> uh, so go on, Jack. Move on. Move on to stadiums. Yeah. Um, stadiums. We're starting off with Faded Town. Uh, Faded Town is the worst of the two stadiums, in my opinion, in the set. Any time between turns, put two damage counters on each Mega Evolution Pokemon. Um, basically, if the format gets super Mega heavy, this may be um, a stadium that is put in decks that don't run don't run uh, megas of their own and don't have a set stadium to play um but other than that i feel there's nothing much to say about faded town i don't feel megas are super overpowered at the moment because they still require quite a lot of setup a lot of the time um and i think there's definitely ways around uh the megas i just feel like it's a bit of an okay card it's it's a it's a niche card that may be seen in some decks some people may think um, oh, I hate I hate playing against Mega Evolutions, and I don't already have a stadium in my deck, so Faded Town doesn't really hurt me, um, but it's going to hurt all of the Mega decks I face. Um, but I don't think it's sort of got any solid sort of deck that it's definitely going to go in um, as the stadium of choice, just because there's either better stadiums, or there's really no need for a stadium like Faded Town, um, in my opinion at least. Yeah, I don't think it serves many purposes. That like, I'd prefer almost every other stadium to this card. If I just wanted to throw something in as a counter stadium, this wouldn't even be like in the top three that I would pick. Uh, the only interesting thing I would say is that it's one way of getting around a focus sashed Groudon. I think does that work? Yeah, uh, yeah, turns. I believe so. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's the only way I could see this ever being played. If Groudon is, you know, the top of tier one. Um, and you need to just, or like your deck just has a horrible matchup against that, you could maybe try and put one of these in for that clutch kill on the Groudon. Um, but other than that, I think it has almost no playability. Uh, let's go on to a very much more playable uh, stadium. It's Forest of Giant Plants. If you listen through our Pokemon uh, section, part one of this uh, set review, we discussed a lot of even new cards that could benefit from Giant Plant uh, Forest. Or Forest of Giant Plants, I guess. Broken Vine Space, as we all like to call it. Um, it allows you to evolve your grass types on the very first turn of the game, even if you put it down uh, on that turn. So uh, you can evolve up through Stage 1s, through Stage 2s, all in one go. Uh, we've brought up a few pictures of some grass types that we sort of have to look again in a new light in terms of being slightly improved by this stadium card. So the Shiftry... Um, it has a nice ability that allows you to draw cards when you discard a grass. And the range dance doing 20 times uh, the number of bench Pokemon in play. Um, so it's pretty much like a slower version of Empoleon um, in terms of slower attacking wise. But it can be a big hitter. And Forest of Giant Plants means you can actually get Shift Free going quite early now. Uh, it's pretty useful for Shedinja, although it most likely needs a different stadium anyway. If you're playing Shedinja, um, it means we can attack turn one with Vespiquen. It means Vileplume can get set up in a turn. I think that's one of the most notable ones. Uh, Sceptile can actually become a fairly handy uh, energy accelerator now, even though it does take up quite a bit of space in the deck. 
Um, Nurture and Heal is a fairly handy thing for colorless Pokemon and just grass types in general. Uh, we have Mega Sceptile EX, of course. Uh, this card will be utilized in Mega Sceptile decks. Mega Venusaur as well. It's a Mega Pokemon that doesn't have a Spirit Link, but at least with Frost of Giant Plants, we can um, Mega Evolve Turn 1 to end our turn, so you don't really lose out much there, because Venusaur is never going to be a in Turn 1 anyway, really. Um, and that has quite an interesting attack. It can auto-paralyze, much like the Ampharos, so it could be a toss-up between those two, really. I feel like Crisis Vine actually does a slightly better job than the Ampharos' attack does, so quite interesting there. Uh, the Ariados as well that we've discussed. Also, there's a Dustox that has the Delta Plus, and I've only ever seen this um, be used with Bats, so that you can use his second attack uh, that snipes 50 damage. Um, use that with a bat so you can try and snipe maybe a Shaman for three prizes or some other lower HP stuff uh, for multiple prizes. That could be quite interesting. It's quite clunky, but it's faster now at least, I guess. And there's also Beedrill that has Allergic Shock, which can um, mean that your opponent's active... No, if they're defending Pokemon, um, is damaged by an attack the following turn and gets knocked out, even if it's like 10 damage or whatever. Uh, so that's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, it would have to be in a lock-style deck. I think Beedrill's still fairly um, techy and strange rather than that good. But there's just plenty of options for grass types now. And in the future sets, we have to really look at every other grass type in the light of, oh, wow, I can actually set up this stage two on turn one now, so maybe it's actually slightly more playable. Yeah, I mean, I can see, I'm looking at the... 10 cards we've got on the screen, and I can see four concepts I already want to try. So that's what Giant Fl uh, Forest of Giant Plants basically does. It just it's, it just makes Grass Type on the whole um, really good. Um, I do expect to see some underwhelming Grass Types over the next couple of sets, just because of how much Grass Support and how good Forest of Giant Plants is. Um, but like Joe said, you're definitely going to have to look at all Grass Types in another light now, and really think... Do I do I does this make this uh, does Forest Jump Hearts make this card better? Uh, does it even make it playable? Does it make it a certain tier? Does it have good matchups? There's a lot more questions you now have to ask about some of these initial grass types that you might think oh not very good. Um, being able to set them up in one turn may just m push them into the playable tier. Um, and yeah, it's definitely going to really change how we look at a lot of grass types coming up. Um, next up onto the trainers we have Eco Arm. Um, Eco Arm is a really interesting, kind of really awkward item. Shuffle three Pokemon tool cards from your discard pile into your deck. Um, really good for things um, with Theta Double, uh, just because you can get your tools back um, and you're not losing a lot of value for Theta Double after taking one or two knockouts. Um, but I think the most notable use is really Headringers. You can get head, you can get back Headringers, um, which your opponent has either zero sicked off themselves or found a way of getting rid of them. Um, you can actually get them back and reapply them to your opponent's um, EX Pokemon, which is I think is really annoying. Um, they may, but I can't ever see it being amazingly useful in too many decks. Obviously, it really benefits, like I said, the Theta Double decks. Um, but other than that, I don't think it's at all a staple or at all a overpowered card it's just a card that some people may use in the theta double decks um and some people may pass up on just for more tools themselves <laughs> yeah i think this is card, card is actually hilarious for tool drop in expanded um <laughs> because you can get loads of tools back which is pretty cool um but other than that i think in general i think even in many theta double decks like the nj deck i think just playing maximizing out the copies of important tools is going to be better than playing one to two of this card, because a lot of times it's dead in the hand, and you've just got to juniper it away a lot of the time, and it's not really good having dead cards in your deck. So even like the Headringers, like you say, yeah, it's a cool little combo you can do, but I'd rather just have three to four Headringer, and not many decks even need to have three to four. A lot of the time we just see uh, two ofs of Headringer in the first place, because you're only really going to get value out of those first two that you put on the field, and you can sort of deal with not having them late game because you've pretty much like already taken the advantage at that point. So I think Eco Arm is not going to be played very often unless you're playing Tool Drop and Expanded, in which case it's uh, pretty fun, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to Energy Recycler. It um, allows you to shuffle five basic energy cards from your discard pile back into your deck. Um, I think it's pretty good. Um, there's You've got to be a very energy-heavy deck to need it. Um, 
the fact that it goes into the deck is kind of awkward. We've seen superior energy retrieval um, gets it to the hand for the discard, which is probably more powerful than this. Um, I can't think of a deck that springs to mind where I'm like, oh man, I really need to have two of this card in or something like that. Um, but it's just a good like thing to stop you decking yourself out. Of course, we don't have anything like Super Rod anymore. We just have Energy Recycler, which gets five energy back. And then we also have Sacred Ash getting five Pokemon back. It's annoying that we don't have a card that combines the two in some sort of way. That's often much more versatile. Um, but I guess if you're a very heavily focused uh, energy-based deck, um, getting back all that energy is one way of, uh, I guess, winning the game and resetting your clock. Um, overall, I'm not too impressed, but it's a nice little utility card for those sorts of decks if they start springing up. Yeah, I mean, things like... Um, de decks like Primal Kyogre may try and fit in one, just because they like having a lot of energy, but again, it goes into your deck and not into the hand, which is really annoying. Um, and they've got things like energy retrieval, which they well, they would always prefer to use. Um, yeah, nothing much to say about this card. I just wish we still had something like Super Rod, like Joe said, to combine the effects, because I think Super Rod was a staple in pretty much well, a lot of decks, at least one of, just because of how useful it was to get back certain pieces that you maybe had to Juniper early, um, or get back that last energy you needed um, to search your deck for. But, you know, at the moment we don't have anything like that, so unfortunately we have to stick with the... Um, the, the the better cards that are actually worse when they're not together in Energy Recycler and Sacred Ash. Um, next up we have Paint Roller. This is a really interesting draw card. Um, Paint Roller discards any stadium in play, and then you draw a card. Um, I believe you have to discard the stadium to draw the card, um, simply because it says sta discard the stadium, then draw a card. Um, so it's only good when your opponent has a stadium. That being said, the stadium war is such an important of the, part of the meta at the moment, and is I think is really going to shape at least the X and Y on rotation, if not further, uh, if not the next couple of rotations to come. Um, just because of how important and how strong some of the stadiums are we have at the moment, we've just mentioned Broken Vine Space, which basically just makes all grass types so much stronger. Um, and this is why the stadium war is so important, and it's, it, we've sort of been building up the stadium war uh, for the f past few sets, um, to the point where now pretty much all decks are running their deck and have some sort of stadium that contributes to um, you winning with that deck. So Paint Roller is definitely um, a welcome card in the Stadium War. That being said, drawing one card and discarding a stadium isn't that great of an effect. Um, unfortunately, drawing the drawing of the one card isn't as um, influential as you'd first think because you can't do it without the stadium. So it means if you want to draw multiple cards with Paint Roller, you need to put your own stadiums and then discard them out of uh, like out of play, which is just awkward. Um, this is a nice way to get through Barrier Shrine Nine Tails, which is really interesting. Um, but whilst I think it improves with the rotation, I don't think it's going to be influential enough to warrant this as like a one-off in every deck just to get through it. Um, I think it's I think it's a perfectly okay card, but I don't think it's particularly strong or particularly amazing. I think it's just a card that may may see some use um, overall, but I don't think it's a, a dead set in any deck really at the moment. No, I'm finding it difficult to place this card. I feel like the only there's a couple of times where I'd like to use this. Maybe like a one or two of in a deck where I can't think of any stadium that would help me. I just want to get rid of my opponents. The draw card is like an added bonus, I guess. Um, but really, it's only if there's a stadium that's really crippling you or really benefiting your opponent and you have nothing that you want to put in your own deck that can help you, I guess. So Paint Roller can be used there. Also, I guess, if you're trying to be really uh, speedy uh, for your deck, you could use something like Scorched Earth. Uh, use the effect of Scorched Earth on a Fighting or Fire. Draw two cards and then Paint Roller your own stadium to get a third card out of it. Um, but I guess that's sort of combo-based, and I don't think um, it's really worth the slots in that situation. So uh, I think the first situation I mentioned, if you just don't have a stadium that you want in your own deck, but you know that, like, you get crippled if your opponent has Steel Shelter in play, maybe like a Sceptile deck or something. And Well, I guess that's a bad example because they have a great stadium, but ex <laughs> I need to think of an example where um, you don't want to play a stadium. Yeah. Uh, I can't really think of one to I, hand, I but think, there will be decks that don't need stadiums, I think the and fact that's that, where maybe Paint Roller comes in. I think the fact that it took you a while to even think proves <laughs> that there are so many good stadiums out there at the moment that a lot of decks like that Paint Roller yeah. is just sort of 
a, a niche card that maybe well, is underwhelming compared to you running your own stadium that's going to benefit you that in that way. Um, it's a nice idea, but overall I think it's underwhelming. Um, yeah, pretty niche. Yeah. We have Levelable next. It's a reprint from um, a really old set. It's been out of format and it's just returned. Uh, Level Ball is one of my personal favorite cards. Um, you get to search your deck for a Pokemon with 90 HP or less, reveal it and put it into your hand, shuffling the deck afterwards. So it's a free card, a free search card, which is really nice. Like It really works well with a lot of stage ones and basics, helps you flood your board quite early. Uh, it can even be used with the new um, unknown to net yourself, basically draw a card. You can turn Level Ball into saying that, essentially. Um, and it's going to be an amazing search for a bunch of things. Uh, I've already mentioned Bronzong earlier on uh, in part one, where you can just flood the field with these when you play like three to four level balls plus three to four ultra balls. That You can just flood the field really quickly. It's going to really benefit Raichu as well. That's a deck where I played like two or three repeat balls. They're instantly going to get switched out for level ball because they're just way, way better. Um, it's going to help get these evolutions going really rapidly. Um, it's going to help decks like Aromatisse and Slurpuff, maybe. Um, Slurpuff doesn't really have the float stones anymore, but um, tasting still can be useful on the bench, and it's level ball searchable, so that's nice. The bats prefer this as well. I think it's even better than repeat ball, uh, because getting Golbats and Zubats is just so important. It's not necessarily the Crobat that's always going to be the thing, and for the majority of the time, it's uh, better than repeat ball, because you don't actually need a Zubat already in play to get value out of it, so... Uh, it's pretty just good off from the offset. Vespulkin loves it as well, and even Ninetales. Just anything you can think of, really. Uh, it makes Stage 1s as a deck much better. It helps out stuff like Night March and anything that runs uh, lower HP stuff. So I am absolutely an avid fan of Level Ball. It's fantastic. Fantastic search card. Yeah, Level Ball's really cool. Um, like Joe said, it really opens up a lot of avenues for stage ones as you can see all eight of the pokemon that we've got there are stage ones and with all of the support for stage ones with flareon and vespiquen uh well the evolutions and vespiquen um i think like i said in the first part it's sort of a set where you have um a, a deck from the get-go you have uh, a load of uncommons that are all 90 hp stage ones um, that can all be searched with through level ball you're not going to have to spend a lot of money to sort of have a pre-made deck for you um, which is a lot my, like Night March in the Phantom Forces set. Um, so I really like that sort of aspect of Level Ball. Um, and it's it's really nice to see it come back. I'm just wondering whether we're going to get like, any like other any of the other Ball Search star mechanics back. Maybe we'll get like Heavy Ball or something. That'll be really interesting to see how whether they um, adapt well, uh, whether they're reprinted first, and if they ever are, whether well, how they adapt the format. Um, but yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see... Um, whether we get any other of these ball searches, um, but I think Level Ball is definitely the one that everyone wanted the most, just because it's just well, just because of how good it was when it was first released. Um, next up, we have the golden sort of shiny cards in the set. Um, we have a reprint of Energy Retrieval and a reprint of Trainer's Mail. Um, nothing too much to say here. They're just your shiny golden reprints. It's just going to mean. Um, that both of these cards are going going to see an extra rotation or two, um, unless they're not reprinted beforehand. There's nothing really to say about either of them. Um, I'm glad we're getting trainers now reprinted because I think it's one of the best trainers we've got at the moment. And it's nice to see energy retrieval reprint as well. I think I'm relatively confident in saying I think energy retrieval will be a pretty much a staple, um, one of the staple trainers like potion or energy switch, um, or energy search, I think energy retrieval will be a staple from now on, in in, in my own opinion at least. Uh, next up, we'll just move on to the Spirit Links as well. Not really much to mention here. Uh, I guess artwork-wise, they're pretty impressive, but um, that's all I really need to say about the Spirit Links. It's good that we still have them. Um, everyone will benefit from having this. So um, yeah. It's good to see the Spirit Links continuing with Megas, because... Without it, the Mega Revolution rule is pretty disgusting for a lot of cards, so good to yeah. see those. The only real thing I have to say about Spirit Links is it, I was speaking to someone the other day and it, um, ab about having a Universal Spirit Link and how that would have changed the format. Rather than having a Spirit Link or three other Spirit Links in every set, how one Universal Spirit Link that you attach to your Pokemon and it said when this Pokemon becomes Mega, you don't lose your turn. It would have been interesting to see how that affected the format instead um, because we would have had things like the... Um, 
Mega Venusaur that you mentioned earlier on, and Mega Lucario, things like that, they would have actually probably been very playable. Um, but it, but it's and it's kind of sad to see that those the first batch of Megas probably won't ever get Spirit Links, which I, I think is kind of sad because I, I think they sort of launched the Spirit uh, the Mega mechanic in 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 the wrong in the wrong way because no one really played the Megas until um, Phantom Forces came out. Uh, but I suppose there's nothing really we can do. It's just sort of throwing around some ideas about how a universal Spirit Link would have worked. But yeah, the artwork on these Spirit Links looks really cool. Um, f the final trainer we've got is Lucky Helmet. That this is another tool. Um, whenever this, po whenever the Pokemon this card is attached to is your active Pokemon and is damaged by an, an opponent's attack, draw two cards. Um, this is really interesting. In I, I feel it's only super useful in decks that have uh, Pokemon with Theta Double because I think a lot of the time you're going to want something like a Muscle Band or a Hard Charm or a Spirit Link on instead, um, just because they're the primary tools that you're going to want on however anything that can expend the t expend having a tool on and have a lucky helmet is going to be really useful considering the only well there's no n anymore the only um shuffle in that your opponent can do to you is ace trainer it means that these two cards that you draw from the lucky helmet you're more than more often than not going to be keeping them um which is really really cool and it means you don't have to draw sort of draw the two cards, and then worry about playing them that turn because you're scared of the end coming down the next turn and not getting value out of these cards. You can then, I feel the whole format slows down um, in that regard, and it means that you don't have to play everything so proactively. You can sort of sit and think about what you've got left um, and what to do with the cards that you draw. Um, overall, though, I think Lucky Helmet, I don't think it's going to be seen in too many decks. I think it it's definitely uh, de definitely benefit is a benefit of most when you have the theta double ability um, ancient trait, but I don't think it's super super powerful. I think it's just an, an okay tool for them to run if they don't already have sort of two tools they need to run, um, like a spirit link and maybe a hard charm or a muscle band or something. Yeah, overall, I think I'm very underwhelmed by this card. I personally think I would value just drawing one card. Uh, at the time, much higher than drawing two cards next turn, because I want an immediate response for a card that I play, if that makes sense. Definitely, like you say, the value of tools has to be very high, because we have Muscle Band, which is so important. We have Hard Charm that can really help out certain decks, and um, Lucky Helmet doesn't seem strong enough for me. Um, there's only a couple of decks that I would consider it in. Like you say, the Theta Double uh, cards, potentially, the Metagross is like a cute combo, but I don't think that's a playable uh, card, really. Maybe in Gyarados, because um, you use Max Revive to get your Magic Arts back. So effectively, if they kill a Gyarados, you're retrieving a Magic Arp each time. Um, so that combo works, I guess. Uh, but overall, very niche, and I'm underwhelmed by it, just because um, I'd rather have immediate cards, and I'd rather have other tools on my Pokemon for the majority of the time. Uh, so on to the special energy now, and we have flash energy first of all for lightning type Pokemon. Only you can only attach it to lightnings, and um, it provides lightning energy. And um, the Pokemon this card is attached to has no weakness. This is very very cool. I think um, we have some playable lightning types in the format right now. Um, Manetric springs to mind. It could really benefit from this, and um, also Ampharos, I guess to an extent. Definitely if you're paralyzing things with that HP, and if you can't get hit through weakness, it's going to be difficult for a lot of decks to hit through Amphros in a turn, so potentially there's some viability there thanks to Flash Energy. Um, overall, though, Manetric likes to accelerate energy, and uh, you can't really accelerate specials through his attack, so I wouldn't want to play more than maybe two Flash Energy unless fighting decks got crazy, crazy popular. And... Um, the only other popular lightning types really are um, Raichu, and that needs DCE. So I don't think Flash Energy, although it's pretty powerful, I think it's not really well placed in the current lightning types that we have. But it's a, potentially a good one to build on for future lightning Pokemon, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, I think Flash Energy overall is underwhelming. I think there was some probably some cooler things that they could have done with the effect. I think having no weakness is kind of a boring effect, especially when compared to something like Dangerous Energy. Whilst it's probably a better effect than Dangerous Energy's effect, I think it's just sort of 
again, like an underwhelming effect. It's just like one line of text. Um, that being said, it, it's it's a cool idea. Um, but like you said, I don't think it fits at the moment. I think Flash Energy um, fits best in, actually in Mega Ampharos. I don't think it really works well with um, the Mega Manetric, just because, like you say, they want to be accelerating. Um, I guess we don't really know how strong Enhanced Hammer is going to be going into X and Y on. But I think Mega Manetric really benefits from not being affected by hammers whatsoever. Um, or Enhanced Hammers at least whatsoever. Especially when um, they can really accelerate without the use of DCEs. So I think I, I don't really like it too many too much in Mega Manetric. Like you say, maybe a one or two of at most. Um, and then Raichu again just loves its DCEs. So you're never going to pick um, Flash Energy a two-turn attachment of Flash Energy and Normal Energy over DCE um, when 90 HP is relatively weak anyway, so it's probably going to be going down even without weakness. So it, it doesn't really... The weakness... Um, well, negating the weakness doesn't really matter overall. And then finally, we have Dangerous Energy. This will be the last card we talk about today. Um, dangerous Energy, when attached to a Dark type... It can only be attached to a Dark type. When attached to a Dark type um, and is your active Pokemon and is damaged by a Pokemon, opponent's EX, put two damage counters on the opponent's EX. Um, I think this would have been a really interesting card if it wasn't just EXs. I think the fact it is EXs is Pokemon's way of saying, okay, we realise we've made some really strong EX cards, so let's um, try and stop them. But I think having it as all Pokemon would have been a lot better. Um, obviously, the old special Dark Energy meant that you did plus 20 damage, um, and that's what uh, Strong Energy does now. But I don't think it would have hurt to even give given like a strong energy type energy to dark types, just because I think special dark was a really cool sort of um, strategy, and I really would have I really would have thought some dark types um, perhaps could have been a lot more viable now. Um, obviously, Uvatol was a, a dominating force in the format at one point, but since then it hasn't really seen much play. I think with special darks it may have seen a bit more play. Um, especially with the fact that it can work off a of special dark and DCE. Whilst that's a lot of special energy, um, you're getting some real value out of your attacks there. Um, dangerous energy, however, is sort of... Um, it's not really proactive. Your opponent can activate it when they want. Um, they can choose when they put the two damage on. If they if they don't want to two-shot you, if they want to wait to build up, in it, build up some energy on like a Lugia or something to one-shot you instead, they can do that. I don't really feel the effect's too strong overall. Um, I can definitely see it being paired with... Um, Tyranitar, but again, I don't think I'd want more than two or three of them because they can't be accelerated by uh, Baby Uvatol, which means that you're going to have to manually attach them. Um, and again, the deck is already running DCEs more than likely, meaning that you're really susceptible to Enhanced Hammer, which I really don't like, just especially going into a format where we don't know how important Enhanced Hammer is going to be, at least. Yeah, I feel like Dangerous Energy's usage is niche. It's almost like the Lucky Helmet, like I was saying you sort of want instant activation of the card. Like, if you attach and then could just place two counters, I think that would be amazing. Um, but you don't really get that effect. So your opponent can crushing hammer it away, and then nothing happens, really. So it's just a more susceptible version of a dark energy that you could be playing. And, like like you say, I can only really see it be paired with T-Tar. It's already worried about Headringers, and those types of decks that do run Headringer often run other trollish cards like Enhanced Hammer. And because it has such a high energy cost, I think it's really crucial to not lose your energy and really only have basic darks in there and the, like two to three DCs uh, for when you want to finish off the attack and get ready to go. So overall, um, kind of not that useful overall. Um, just that it's so outweighed by the fact that it can be hammered away than the benefits that it can give, in my opinion, because there's easy ways for us to get two counters on things to get the trigger uh, for Tita, that it's not really relevant to play this card at all, really. So that's going to wrap it up, I think, Jack. Anything yep. else to say? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. These <laughs> we had to split it into two videos. It was a long set of videos, but um, well, I think we've covered pretty much everything that we wanted to cover. Um, but feel free if there's any card that we missed, comment uh, just comment down below what you think we missed, and we'll we can it, give you sort of an explanation of what we think on it. If there's anything specific that we didn't mention in the past two videos. Um, I think we mentioned quite a lot of the cars that people are talking about, um, and definitely cars that you're going to see in the competitive scene. Um, but bar that, we don't have much else to say. We're going to start trying to get as many deck analysis videos out to you guys as possible. Um, the set comes out on Wednesday. Both of us sort of have busy schedules over the next two weeks. Um, but 
we're going to try and get as many videos to you as possible. Uh, just bear with us, and um, we'll, we'll definitely get as many deck analysis videos to you um, as we can, as as and when we are a well, yeah, able to. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything else to say. It, do you, Joe? Um, well, yeah, I think the box my boxes are coming on Wednesday or Thursday, so expect openings of those to come up definitely. Uh, we're both going to be on holiday, so it's more likely it's going to be PCCGO content than anything other than that. However, over the next coming weeks, until we do both go on holiday, we're going to be, uh, well, at least I know I am, I'm going to be filming like crazy, and I think Jack's got a few ideas as well. So uh, we're going to get still content out for you again. It's going to pick up this week, I think, but then we do both go on holiday uh, for a, over a week, so um, it might just be PTCGO content from there on. But bear with us, we have a lot of ideas for Agent Origins already, and we're going to be testing like mad, as you can expect, hoping to uh, kickstart the new season when uh, those tournaments do start swinging around. So I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed this two-parter. hope you stuck with us to the end. Uh, we discussed a lot of different ways of playing some of these new cards, hopefully shed some light on them. If you weren't really sure, sat on the fence of a, uh, some of the cards. I know I was when I first saw them. So hopefully we shed some light on that and gave you some new ideas going forward of how to build these decks. So uh, it's been Joe and Jack here from Omnipoke. And uh, see you next time, guys. Cheers.